Till Hazel started his career as a lawyer, Harvard trained, came back home to work in the region in which he grew up. It was beginning to be a far different region from the agricultural area that Till recalled as a child. Much of the development that we now see in, in Fairfax County and throughout Northern Virginia were the dreams of Till Hazel implemented by him and many others. But he was a man of vision, created large communities including Burke Center and others throughout Fairfax County. Well, thank you, Jerry. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. And I'll try not to bore you and I'll try to talk about some things that might be of interest. Because Fairfax County and Northern Virginia are close to my heart and have been since I was born and raised in Arlington County and moved to Fairfax in 54, 56, uh, because a fellow in the law firm that I was then working for told me there was a future in Fairfax. And when I came to Fairfax two days later, I found out there was a future here and it was one that we could all help to develop. Now I've got two assignments. One is to talk about the agricultural history of the county and the others are talking a little bit about George Mason and how it happened. I'm pleased to do both. As far as the time frame, we could start Fairfax County about the time George Washington moved into Mount Vernon, and not much happened here until after the Second World War. Uh, I wasn't here all of that time, but I'll be here 85 years in a few more days, so I can think about a lot of it that I witnessed personally, which I'll try to relate. First thing I'll tell you didn't happen at, in Fairfax County, but the first time I saw an airplane take off was somewhere in the mid-30s, and the fellow, the flag man, went out and flagged down traffic on Route 1 so the plane could take off across Route 1. And that kind of sets the stage for where we were. During, in 1939, my dad, who was raised on the canal in Georgetown, very poor family, who was then a surgeon, and eventually found at Arlington Hospital, was coming back from a brief vacation at Ocean City, and I heard him whispering to my mother that we needed a farm because food was going to be short. There was a war coming. And indeed, we shortly after that acquired a hundred acres that I can see from the building between here and Mack Lane and created a small dairy farm. Now, just to set the stage further, I became very much involved in the farm, and I used to come up after school because during the war, I went to Washington Lee High School, during the war there wasn't much school afternoon, and I'd come up in the afternoon and plow, and guess what I plowed with? A team of Percheron horses, because we couldn't find a tractor in 1941, tractors were hard to get, horses were more available. And for the first three or four years, until at the end of the war, we had horsepower. And again, I can see from here where the horsepower was. And just to set the stage a little bit about county and about Tyson's Corner, in those days, Tyson's too was the site of a gravel pit. 50 cents a ton FOB and bought gravel from Marcus Bless at Tyson's too. The picture of the beer joint was what you saw first on the scheme, and that was the beer joint. That was where workers going up to Loudoun County after work used to stop and buy beer. Along in the 50s, I acquired that for the highway department that then was a firm that represented them. And all the parking was on the state right of way. And the state offered him $3,000 for the beer joint and he said, gee, that's not enough. I'm cashing in 50,000 a year tax free selling beer to these guys going up the road. And here you only offered me $3,000 for my establishment. Now let's look around the county a little bit at what else was in the county. Herndon had an international harvester dealer and my mother used to drive me up. I didn't get a license until I was 14. I'd started driving when I was 12 because things were a little different during the war. But when we went to Herndon to buy equipment for the farm, we went through the Bowman farm where they were feeding mash from the distillery and had 2,500 acres in beautiful agricultural 
use between Route 7 and Herndon. When you looked around the rest of the county, some prominent names operated dairy farms. That's what they made their living on. Omer Hearst's father, Ed Lynch's father, the Kinchlows, all had dairy farms. And around here in McLean, during the war, there were a lot of truck farms, 10, 15, 20 acres. In fact, Evans Farm was then a farm where he raised crops on his little contours. And I had found a little combine and a baler and barred a tractor. And I used to go over there and cut wheat and cut and bale hay for Mr. Evans at Evans Farm Inn. I was over there the other day for an event. It looks a lot different than it did in 1945. But that was the beginning of Fairfax County. It was an agricultural community. One thing I almost didn't mention, when I was working the farm over here in Mac Lane, my grandfather stayed with us a little while and he had a horse. He was an ex-cavalryman from the 7th Cavalry in the West. And I used to ride the horse through Fairfax, through Falls Church out the Annandale Road to Dr. Lee's place at what was then called Ravensworth to breed the horse. And there was a blacksmith behind Falls Church Church who used to shoe our horses. And all this was the community that Fairfax was at the end of the war. There was really very little impact of the war effort in Fairfax County at that time. I remember... Again, I can see the site from here, bailing hay and watching them begin to build Pemmet Hills, which was started in 1946. Shirley Highway didn't exist except down to King Street. All these things were the beginning of what we now know as Fairfax County. Now, when you look at the governance of county and trying to capture it in, in, uh, in decades, the 40s, the county was operated by farmers and agricultural interests. That was the business of the county. In the 50s, we began to get new citizens that moved into Pimmett Hills and other developments. And Fairfax County began to be contested as far as what the county would look like. The county board was still run by mostly the agrarian types. Wallace Carper was chairman. And it was, it was in the 50s that people began to move in and the complexion of the county began to change. Now remember, we didn't have a beltway then. We didn't have Shirley Highway completed. We didn't have Dully's Airport. In fact, Dully's Airport was the scene of a huge feedlot. They used to feed four or 5,000 cattle at the site of Dully's Airport in the 50s. So the county was in transition in the 50s, and then came the 60s. The 60s was really the beginning of the major conflict about the future of the county. That's when we began to have more residents on quarter-acre lots and fewer farms and no agriculture. And that set up the context for the issues that developed in the 60s as to whether we would continue to grow as a what kind of growth we'd have. I couldn't say continue to grow. We certainly, by that time, farming had been abandoned. There was a lot of land vacant. There was a, the, the stone quarry at Tyson's II was sort of half vacated. The site of Tyson's I was still an open site. I've got to remind you that in the late 50s when I was in college, I used to come home in the summer and cut wheat and bale hay. And there was a 12 acre site on which this building sits, which I cut wheat on every summer for four or five years during the 40s. All those things were the background of the county. But the real conflict on where the county was going to go, as Jay and Earl and Sid will tell you, I'm sure, came in the, in the 60s when people began to contest and question whether this was a county that wanted people or not. A major effort became prevalent in the 60s as to fight growth. The anti, as I call them, started forming organizations to fight growth. But let me talk for a minute about George Mason. 
George Mason started at Bailey's Crossroads in an eight-room old schoolhouse. That was where several politicians from Arlington County who were in the General Assembly decided that there should be a university. Hank Mann, Charlie Fenwick, Ms. Campbell. And they decided that the place to start it was in the abandoned schoolhouse. That started in 58. There was obviously no future of it at Bailey's Crossroads. At that time, there was still an airport at Bailey's Crossroads. And by the way, I forgot to mention that back in the 50s and 60s, there was an airport landing strip along 29, right where the Annandale Road crosses 29. Uh, back in the, in the 30s, I used to ride a horse that my grandfather gave me, and the place to ride it was in the median of Arlington Boulevard because there was no traffic. And that made it a good place, a good bridle path. And that's, again, a part of the county. But let's get back to George Mason. I didn't mean to delve into the other. Uh, in, in the early 50s, the, the directors, the, the political group, mostly Hank Mann by that time, decided that they ought to have a place to really build a university. It was obvious to a few of us that Northern Virginia needed a university. They needed a place of learning that could drive the economy and the future of this great area. Jack Wood, who was then the mayor of Fairfax, and I don't know how many of you all might have known Jack, but he was blind. He had lost his eyesight early. He was practicing law in the city of Fairfax, and he decided that he would make a real play. And talking about his blindness, I once was in his office and he was talking about where they ought to contribute $2 million to underground the power lines through the city. And George says, I can't, or Jack said, I can't see him. I'm not going to spend $2 million to bury him. <laughs> it's just sort of the way things work. But Jack decided that Fairfax City would make a play for George Mason. There were two other sites in serious contention. One was at Ravensworth, where the park now is, and the other was Reston. And Jack was a fellow who knew how to act. And instead of conversation, he got the city to buy 150 acres of land adjacent to the city and say, here, this settles the problem. We'll give you the land and you put the university in Fairfax. The university did come. The university acquired another 250 acres to make the 450 acre campus we now have. And then the question was how to deal with that. We had a serious problem. The university started as a satellite of the UVA. The president of UVA was very helpful, but downstate was not helpful toward Northern Virginia. I have to be very blunt about that. Downstate still viewed Northern Virginia as a bunch of liberals and worse than that, Yankees. And we didn't have a very good voice. I used to say I had a visa to, to Richmond because I had been appointed by the senior circuit judge to support young Harry when he ran for the Senate for his father's seat in 1966. Anybody that doubts that there was a bird machine, I can tell you a lot about how that worked. The judge called me one day and said, young Harry needs a campaign manager. And you're the man. And I said, Judge, I don't know anything about politics. He said, you don't have to know anything. Just put a sign in the window and you'll learn. <laughs> well, that, that connection sort of gave me a little view of what was going on in Richmond. So eventually, thanks to Linwood Holton, we got separated from the University of Virginia in 1972. Then the issue was, what do you do after you get independent, how do you build a university? It was obvious we needed a university of substance. We were getting very little support from downstate. The university was cloistered. It was almost a, a group that was so internally concerned about growth that they didn't know how to do it. And one day I realized, and again I apologize for the eye, but that's the way it was. I was then the rector. I thought, I don't know whether this was in 78, I don't know whether we ought to 
told my wife, I don't know whether I ought to continue to be on that board or not because I don't know how to build a university. Well, about the same time, I had an opportunity to dismiss the president we then had, and then the question was, where do you find a new president? Because I knew we had to have a president that understood what the vision was and understood how to accomplish the vision and understood how to build a university in Northern Virginia. And then comes what I call the three martini lunch. We had 300 applicants for president. There was only one that I really thought was appropriate, and that was a fellow named George Johnson, who was then the, the, the Dean of Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Temple in Philadelphia. I used to pick George up, take him to the meetings, take him back to the airport, and have lunch probably at the end of the day uh, to visit with George. And on the day that I said, George, you're the man, we're at, we're at the Marriott at Crystal City waiting for the airplane and having lunch. And he says, well, Till, I got to tell you, I didn't apply for the job. My friends thought I was 50 years old, and if I was ever going to do any good in the world, I needed to get out of Temple, and I needed to find out what was out there to look at. Have another martini. He said, well, my wife has just gotten elected to the school board at Bryn Mawr, and we just bought our first house, and I just don't know whether we ought to take this job. Have another martini. On the third one, he said, I'll talk to Joanne. And he came to Fairfax with a vision and a determination and the capability to make things happen. And I've got to tell you what his capability really was. He was from Jamestown, North Dakota. He told me early on that in Jamestown, you either worked for the railroad or you got educated and got out of town. And he, through a series of events, ended up getting a PhD from Columbia University, which was a long way from Georgetown. He played semi-pro baseball and semi-pro basketball in North Dakota, which tells you the kind of guy he was. And when he came to Virginia, it didn't take him 30 days to understand that he had to visit the General Assembly members in their hometowns and not just go to Richmond during a session. He had to create a contact with the people in Richmond who counted. And George spent a year touring the state, visiting the delegates and the senators in their hometown. And that was really the key to his success. Plus, George had the, pardon me, the vision for what was needed at George, at George Mason to make it a major university. We, we, a couple of days after he came, he asked me would I take him down to meet Ron Carrier, who was then doing great things at James Madison. Ron enjoyed, or hosted us for lunch. On the way back, he said, could we ride through Charlottesville? I'd like to see what UVA looks like. We rode through Charlottesville. On the way back, George said, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to create a community that has some interest in Mason, and I'm going to do something that the community will appreciate. And I'm going to do something for the students, and I'm going to do something for the arts. And during his tenure, among other things, he built the field house, which is the only thing we could afford, as a community center. He built the Johnson Center for Students, which incorporated everything from McDonald's to a library, so the students could have easy access. And he finally built the arts center at George Mason, which was quite incredible. Now, when we started George Mason and we started building these things, I told him, don't cut the trees down when you build the arena, because as soon as you start taking those trees down, the animals will try to stop you from building it. And sure enough, and we didn't, we cleared it after we started, but sure enough, when the arena opened, we had television cameras for a week trying to show that it was gonna be a major traffic problem. That sort of highlights where we came from, where I think we went, and how we got to where we are.